right, good morning everyone and welcome to Foundation Baptist Church's morning service this May 24. What a blessing it is to be here by the grace of God. And thank you for joining us for our morning worship service. We hope you will enjoy our continued study on 2 Timothy uh, as we continue through the entire book and see what, what message God has for 21st century Christians like us through this inspired document the last inspired writing of the Apostle Paul. And you will find, and I'm, I've gone through this book a number of times, and it's a blessing to see how the wealth of instruction that Paul gives to Timothy, how they are intended to be God's words for us, especially as Timothy, or Paul rather, the Apostle, uh, is concerned about the next generation of believers. And that is also uh, something in my heart, not only to reach our generation with the gospel, and the claims of Christ, but also to equip the younger generation for the same. So again, thank you for joining us. Now, this is probably our, what, seventh, maybe eighth, I lost count, uh, Sunday, where we have been uh, conducting ministry through virtual or through uh, the Internet. And praise God, and in such a time as this, technology is available so that we can conduct ministry uh, this way. And what is interesting, as we are seeing in 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul, who was quarantined in a sense. He was incarcerated for the preaching of the gospel. And yet that did not hinder him from propagating the truth of the gospel message uh, while in jail. Many of us are quarantined still. And while some parts of the world are beginning to kind of loosen up, and I think this is the same here uh, nonetheless, we are thankful that uh, this, despite our circumstances, God can make the wickedness of men to praise Him. That's the sovereign God of the Bible. And like Paul, he said in 2 Timothy 2, the Word of God is not bound. And isn't that true today in the 21st century? Uh, more than ever, even our own ministry alone, plus many others who conduct, who conduct the same biblical ministry, are reaching more people with the truth of the gospel and the word of God through virtual uh, means, through uh, the internet. And uh, what a blessing. God has his way of accomplishing his purpose, especially as we anticipate his any moment return. So I'd like for us to turn our Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're talking about safeguards against departing from the truth. And uh, as we continue our study, so I'm going to read to you this portion of Scripture, and then uh, let's have a moment of prayer, and then continue with our exposition of the Word of God. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's amazing, we're now in the third chapter, in the closing verses of the third chapter, and in a matter of two more weeks, perhaps, Lord willing, should the Lord tarry is coming, we get through the entire book of 2 Timothy. For our text this morning is chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, from verses 10 to the rest of the chapter. I hope you have your Bibles ready with you, so you can follow with me. Okay? Uh, we, used to, we are so used to uh, responsive reading in our local congregation, uh, but unfortunately, apparently we cannot do that now. So I'll have to read the verses to you. I hope you're following me as, we, as you have your Bibles open as well. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 10 down through 17. Here's what the Bible says. Paul to Timothy, verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions which came unto me in Antioch at Iconium at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a gnomic reality. That's a truth. In any, in any generation, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall have, suffer persecution. Moving on to verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue down the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, verse 17, so that the man of God may be perfect, <clears throat> thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Again, thank you for your and your mercies renewed. Indeed, great is thy faithfulness. But again, we never cease to give you thanks for Calvary, especially for those of us who are in Christ. Thank you for salvation being available, full and free, by your matchless grace. Not because of any merit we've done, but all because of your matchless grace displayed in Calvary. And that is why writer of the Romans, Paul said that uh, God's love, God has commanded his love toward us that while we were sinners, rebels against you, Jesus Christ died for us. It is our prayer this morning, Father, that your spirit will work in opening the eyes of uh, many who might be watching or listening to this broadcast so that those of them who have not trusted in Christ solely as Savior perhaps are still trusting in their human merit, rituals, relics, or rosary beads, or religion. Help them to see that none of these combined can save them or any of us. Each one of us needs to strip ourselves of all our self-righteousness and trust in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ of the saving of our soul. His sacrifice on Calvary is adequate, complete, uh, to sufficiently pay our debt. For he said on the cross, it is finished. And thank you that you have proven it to be acceptable to you by raising him from the dead. And therefore, there is nothing else we can add nor subtract from it. And that all who have not come to Christ, we pray that they will finally trust Him, finally as Savior and Lord. For those of us who have already done so, maybe for the past week or months or even years or decades, we pray that our continued study of the Word of God will simply increase our faith, equip us with the truth of the Word of God so that we are more ready to give an answer to everyone who asks us of the hope, of the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. As we pray as a body of believers, again, we pray for our government authorities or policy makers. We pray for their salvation, that they will also come to know Christ as Savior. Perhaps some of them, through, this, through your divine providence, providence, may hear any of these uh, videos or other videos that explain the gospel, that they too may be brought under conviction, that they will see their desperately lost condition and find from the wrath to come by taking refuge in Christ as Savior. But we pray for them, Lord, regardless of their standing before you. We realize the decisions they make <clears throat> as their government leaders will affect the all of us, the average citizen in uh, the street. And therefore, we pray for wisdom that only you can provide. And so that despite perhaps uh, uh, corruption that might be taking place in the halls of, uh, of power, we thank you that you are sovereign, you are in control, and that, uh, as your word tells us, even the king's heart remains to be in your hands, and like the rivers of water, you turn it whithersoever thou wilt. And for us believers, help us, Lord, as New Testament believers, to, uh, to redeem the time, knowing that the days are evil, to, to number our days that we may apply our hearts into wisdom, to, to avail of the privileges we have, the liberties that we enjoy, to to use every opportunity in time to preach the gospel so that we can make an impact for eternity, so that sinners may be saved and believers can be grounded and be more fruitful and effective witnesses for you. Beginning with ourselves, our own families, our own local ministries, our church, and even others likewise. Lord, open our eyes again as we turn to your word. We, uh, you know each of our needs, our earthly cares and concerns. And we realize, Lord, uh, our hearts go with the many who are wrestling with even food on the table because of uh, <clears throat> the lockdowns that have taken place for over two months now. <clears throat> and therefore, we, however, are thankful that your word assures us that you, are never, you never ran out. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are the God who provides. And in the midst of all the uncertainties of this life, we thank you that we can rest our faith and enjoy the peace that you alone can provide as we rest our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We thank you that your grace is always sufficient and it is unlimitable. 
and that we can always count on it because as your word exhorts us, we are to come boldly into your throne of grace so that we may find grace to help in time of need. Now we ask, Father, your Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds as we turn to your word for instruction. We ask that you will bring conviction to the lost, edification to the believers, and uh, glory to your name. And that your word will be magnified in all of this. And this we ask with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we are on to our second our second Timothy series. And uh, you will recall by this time, I hope you're familiar with the background, the historical setting of the epistle. Paul was addressing Timothy. He, Timothy was his son in the faith. He was instrumental in leading Timothy to Christ. And more likely his family as well. Thankful, uh, what a blessing that Timothy had. He had a godly heritage so that even his own mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, grounded him in the truth of the word of God. And while he was enjoying childhood indoctrination that did not save him, he had to come to a point in time in his life he had to mix his knowledge of scripture with faith. And perhaps some of us here watching, you know, you have some grasp of biblical truth or biblical knowledge, but that knowledge will not save you. You have to humbly accept the truth of the gospel, the word of God. You're a sinner, deserving condemnation, and therefore you need Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And by trusting in him, whosoever believes in him, the Bible says, shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Timothy had to go through that. And that's why Paul talks about his unfeigned faith. Or rather, Paul talks about Timothy's unfeigned or genuine, authentic faith, which he saw apparently Paul so clear evidences of his faith, perhaps to a radically transformed life. We also saw that this is Paul's last inspired epistle, written from prison. And uh, you will remember, we mentioned before, that Paul was released, released from his first detention. And after the burning of Rome in 64 AD of July, Nero, the emperor, in order to stop criticism of himself, blamed the Christians for Rome's burning, and thus Christianity was made an illegal religion. Sometime thereafter, Paul was apprehended and faced certain death. He was in jail for preaching the gospel, and he had a life sentence to face. He was waiting execution. And imagine a life like that. Every day you wake up in the morning, there was no date set for his execution. So every day in the morning, he would wake up and say, is it death or life today? Life or death, life or death. Every time he woke up in the morning, life or death, life or death. And that's why Paul said in one of his prison epistles, Philippians chapter 1, for to, to live. If it's live, live is Christ. If it's die, it dies even better. I'm going to meet my Savior no longer by faith, this time by sight. And those are the options of the Christian. If, are, if you are a child of God, if you're a born-again believer, what a blessed hope everyone has. Regardless of the circumstance we find ourselves in. Remember, Paul's circumstances was not even, our situation is not even close to Paul's circumstances. The restrictions that he had to face for preaching the gospel, being apprehended, he was being curtailed of his liberty to preach the gospel. He was being apprehended for that very reason. And he was facing, facing certain death for that reason. And yet, Paul did not wallow in despair in one corner. He says, Ako na yata ang sa mundo. As we would say it in Tagalog. Rather, he saw every moment and grabbed every opportunity to proclaim the gospel so that should death ultimately knock on his door, he would face Christ face to face. What a blessing. What a, what a powerful testimony this century no wonder his life continues to be a great encouragement to succeeding generations to this day. And thankfully, the, Apostle, the Holy Spirit not only recorded his epistles, his writings, uh, through the miracle of inspiration, but also the Spirit of God has preserved them through these generations for the rest of the church to benefit from it. So chapter 1, we saw the charge Timothy gave to Timothy. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of Christ. In other words, be bold for the truth. Don't be ashamed to be identified with me. I'm a prisoner. I'm sure many of many contemporaries of the apostle, even believers, were kind of hesitant to be identified with the apostle himself because he was incarcerated. He was bearing the reproach of Christ. But Paul says to Timothy, be not ashamed. 
unashamed of the testimony of Christ of me, his prisoner. So be bold for the truth. And that's, an, that's a fitting charge for every believer in the 21st century. The God is truth. It is saving truth. And the, the truth of the gospel is exclusive. It comes from God himself. It is objective. It is not subjective. What was Paul's gospel that will save is the same gospel that we should be proclaiming today. That's why it's been preserved in the sacred text of scripture. It is objective. Therefore, it is the same gospel that saved believers in the first century. It's the same gospel that saved believers in the 21st century, whether that be in the Far East or in the Western world or in the Middle East or any part of the world. It is objective truth. It is rational tr truth. Okay? Biblical Christianity is not unreasonable. It is rational. It is reasonable. That's why God says we are to love Him with all our heart, soul, and mind and strength. Because Christianity is reasonable. It is true. It is authoritative. It is without hypocrisy. It is incompatible with all other religious systems. Because what makes Christianity different from all the rest? That it is God who is reaching out to sinful men. And that while all other religions claim that their God is true, but none of the founders of the religion are alive today. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, when he was crucified and died, rose again from the grave. And among all other tombs of all founders of religion, Jesus Christ's tomb is empty. He is risen from the grave. And we have a, a living Savior, whoever lives to make intercession for us, and he has promised to come back again to take him to take his own with himself. In chapter 2, the charge is to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the midst of all the challenges of proclaiming the truth of the gospel, the obstacles of un ungodly and wicked men to oppose the truth, therefore Paul says, be strong. That's in the passive mood, therefore, because we cannot be strong in ourselves, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We cannot be strong in ourselves. We need outside strength, in the divine enabling, and that grace is in Christ. Why? Because God's truth needs to be protected and proclaimed and taught and transmitted by Christians despite all odds. And we need to do it. And how are we to do it? Paul gives the strategy, the apostolic strategy in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. We are to pass on the truth. He said uh, in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what did he say there? He says, and the things which thou hast heard of me, that's Paul, the first, century, first generation believer, commit thou to faithful men. So Paul is talking to Timothy, he's a second generation believer. Commit to faithful men, that's a third generation believer, who shall be able to teach others also. And that's how Christianity will be passed on from generation to the next. It's the only apostolic succession we find in the Bible. There is no such thing as apostolic succession that the apostles kind of ordained a particular clergy and they will be the ones to be the apostles or the ecclesiastical authorities of succeeding generations like the papacy. There is no such thing. Apostolic succession is the passing on of apostolic doctrine from one generation to the next. And how are we to do this? Commit thou to faithful men. The word commit is what? Paratithemi, Greek word. Para, alongside with. Antithemi means to put, to put alongside. So this, these apostolic doctrines that are not preserved in the New Testament should be placed alongside with believers. To faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. They need to know what the Bible says. And as it's placed alongside in their life, they, they should see not only what the Bible means, but what the Bible means to their personal lives. It's the Bible applied. So that's, how, that's the apostolic uh, strategy for passing on the truth of the gospel. And then chapter 3, we started seeing chapter 3, where Paul talks about how to withstand... The uh, talks about the coming apostasy. People are going to be departing from the truth. The first nine verses of chapter 3 talks about that. And uh, while there were already defections from Christian circles in the first century, century in Paul's day, then uh, it definitely will increase as we approach the end times. So the, the passage that we just read from verses 10 to verse 17 
talks about that we've entitled this safeguards against departing from the truth. See, truth is important because God is truth. That's the very nature of God. And he wants the truth to be passed on aggressively and accurately from one generation to the next. That's why he preserved the word of God, inspired it, preserved it, so that it can be passed on from one generation to the next and explained or expounded uh, to others as well. So remember, chapter 3 talks about uh, the departure from the truth. People today, for instance, we hear talk about, people talk about fake news, fake news. Why? Fake news is, we need to detect where fake news is because fake news can lead to erroneous behavior, faulty conclusions. And if the world sees that, in the unsaved world, that all the more should believers see the danger of false doctrine. Why? Because false doctrine will not only lead to erroneous behavior, it will also lead to eventually not only a wrong perspe perspe perspective of life in this life, but also in that which is to come. It will affect our eternal destiny. A false gospel will give, bring false hopes that will not deliver the soul from sin and hell. And rightly so, for only the gospel, the truth of the gospel can bring that to the heart of the believer. Because the Holy Spirit of truth, he's called the Spirit of truth, will use the word of truth and apply it in the heart of a sincere believer who wants to know him who is the way and the truth and the life, and that is Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're talking about how do you withstand the departure from the truth? Remember verse 1. Perilous times shall come. This know also. Keep this in mind, Timothy. And we all need to keep this in mind. Keep the, uh, the, the, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And it is not rocket science for us to realize that we are living in these last times. Perilous days. The, 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 the description, the names, or rather the, the words, the catalog of sins that Paul mentions. The first of which is men shall be lovers of their own selves. People will be narcissistic. And all the rest of the words and the catalog of sins Paul mentions in chapter 3 verses 1 through 9 certainly is very rampant and reflects our present day pagan or postmodern culture. Because they will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. And you will remember in verse 5, Paul was saying that the departure from the truth will be so pronounced, so rampant, that it will, it will infect and affect the very testimony of the professed Christian church. Verse 5 says people will have a form of godliness, an outward external form of godliness, but they will deny the power thereof. Do we not have many churches like that today? In Christendom, they go through the motions of religion. They go through the motions of church doing, church playing, but they have denied the power of the gospel. They think of, of gimmicks in order to hold and maintain their congregations in their circle, but it's not bringing them to a saving knowledge of Christ. They have denied the power thereof. And one of the ways in which we are to safeguard ourselves against the departure from the truth or from the apostasy is found in verse 5. If your church has been infected by apostasy, has been infected, affected by the departure from the truth, so that it has been denied the power of the gospel, what did Paul say to Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 3, from such turn away. Turn away is an imperative. In the present tense, keep on turning away from them. So that's how you safeguard yourself from the departure of the truth. Turn away from these unholy alliances because they will only lead you to further error. You try to win them, correct them with the truth of the gospel. If they reject it, after the first and second admonition rejects, says Paul to Titus. And such turn away... And then affiliate or associate with genuine believers who would like to honor God and heed His Word as they study the Word of God. So this is, that's the very first point that we see in uh, 
how to safeguard ourselves from the truth. But uh, the rest of the verses, from verses 10 to 17, give us three other safeguards or encouragements in order to withstand the departure from the truth. Remember, we're living in those days. People have rejected the truth of the Word of God. When, when the Bible talks about the faith, it's, it talks about the whole body of Christian doctrine given to us, preserved, uh, taught by the apostles, preserved in the sacred pages of Scripture. That's the faith. It's this, this whole book. Or sometimes it's called in Timothy, the truth. Okay? This is the truth of the Word, the truth of the Gospel. While all truth is God's truth, even, for instance, mathematical truth, one plus one is to two. That's truth. That's God's truth. But it's not part of inspired truth. It's still God's truth. When it talks about departure from the faith, it's talking about departure from the truth. Doctrinally, philosophically, ethically, people are departing from the Judeo-Christian ethic of which we should be basing our beliefs and behavior. No wonder the world is in a mess. Because they do not know whom to recognize or what, how to determine right from wrong or truth from error. They go by the opinions of men or what is politically correct. What are the dictates of the culture? What is traditional rather than what is scriptural? So, we need to heed these portions of scripture. Now especially as we look at what does the Apostle Paul say to Timothy <clears throat> as to how to guard ourselves from the truth. What are the safeguards that the Spirit of God has given to us through His inspired Word so that we can guard ourselves from being contaminated, from falling away? I mean, many will fall away from the faith. And you don't want to be one of the many. I hope so. I don't want to be one of the many. And while many will fall away from the faith, they will depart from the truth. As believers, Paul was telling Timothy, and these are God's words for you as well as for me, that we need to hold our ground on the truth of the Word of God. So what are these safeguards that Paul gives in these verses? Number one, he gives us Paul's godly example, verses 10 to 13. While Paul has described already the characteristics of the end times, the catalog of sins that will be very prevalent in the last days, and he cites Old Testament examples, Janus and Jambres, who withstood Moses, uh, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. And there are many people who are relatives of Janice and Jambres today. They shall proceed no further anyway because their, their deeds will be exposed. And then verse 10, But Timothy, in contrast, you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, Afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So nine aspects. Paul's godly example was a, was a factor to help Timothy to withstand the departure of the truth. There are people whom we respect, godly men whom we see have been radically transformed by the gospel. And we praise God for these men whom God has used and perhaps is still using so that we will not be carried away by every wind of doctrine and slight of men. So Paul says, uh, Paul uh, gives, gives nine aspects in which he contrasts himself from these apostates. I mean, apostates will be everywhere. I mean, we would call them the postmoderns. I mean, they, they, their reference to truth is not the Bible. In fact, they have no reference to the truth. They have no absolute truth. Truth to them is truth. Whatever you perceive as truth and may be different from my perception of truth, but as long as you're happy where you are, then that's acceptable to me. That's postmodernism. But Paul contrasts himself from these apostates and says, Timothy, you've known, you have fully known, that is, you have followed closely, defining a definite relationship of a disciple to his master. So you, that means to carefully note with a view of reproducing. Timothy, you've seen my life. 
Paul tells him. And so uh, you can take it as an example. Paul would say that. In other words, Paul was so transparent to Timothy because he saw him through and through the kind of life that has been transformed by the gospel. You know, that's what happens to a person who's been genuinely saved. See, it becomes, because it is living and abiding by the truth of the word of God, there is nothing to hide. Now, what about us? Is there something in our lives that we are kind of trying to keep and put it inside our closet because we know that it is something to be ashamed of? At least for Paul, not, not that he was perfect, he was far from perfect. But at least he knew that his imperfections had been de dealt with by the grace of God. By the gospel. So Paul was transparent. He said, Timothy, you've known my doctrine. It's another word for teaching. My manner of life. That's his conduct. This is the result of sound doctrine. The result of sound doctrine is sound conduct. Orthodoxy, that sound doctrine, results in orthopraxy, straight living. The, one, the way one leads his life, the manner of life Paul talks about here is the way he leads his life, denoting his general behavior, which a man's closest associate can never fail to know in all of its aspects. You know my purpose, what is his guiding motive of his life and work, which is the carrying out of the Great Commission, and to win Christ's approval. I hope that's ours as well. But Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. See, that's his overriding purpose. As I live, I will preach the Great Commission, the gospel of Christ. As I live, I seek to uh, get God's, his approval. But to die is even better, to see him face to face. You've known my faith. This is a reference to his fidelity or faithfulness or his confidence in Christ. And his convictions, which are based on divinely revealed truth. And this faith that Paul had enabled him to triumph in every circumstance. What a blessing. You study carefully the life of the Apostle Paul and the obstacles and the persecutions and the trials that he had to face from outside the household of faith and sometimes from within the household of faith. But his faith led him to over to be an overcomer. And it should be the same for us. But listen, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, you do not have to live under the circumstances because we, are, we can live above the circumstances by appropriating by faith all that we have in Christ. Paul says, you've known my suffering or long suffering. Let's talk about, talk about his patient endurance as well earthly sojourn and his long suffering caused him to hold out long until the fruit of his labors should appear so let's keep on planting the seed remember what we sow we will reap in our life in our in our loved one's life in our family's life in our children's life keep planting the seed of the gospel as we pray on God to bear, bring the fruit of our labors so he persisted in his efforts, Paul did, in order to reach and to train men in the gospel ministry. And sure enough, he didn't, allow, didn't have many, but he had a Titus, Titus. He had a Timothy who would carry on the baton of the ministry as he would pass out from the scene. You've known my charity. His love, this enabled him to win many from whom others showed no concern. It was his compassion and love for the lost and even for obstinate sinners that persisted him in bringing them the life-transforming part of the gospel to them because he was concerned about them. And there are people in our life, in our ministry, who will have no concern for the truth of the gospel. Perhaps it will even be hostile, not only to the gospel that we preach to them, but to us. But we should be able to overcome that as we allow the, the Spirit of God to fill us so that we manifest the fruit of the Spirit. So this also made Paul rise above issues like jealousy and strife that sometimes happens even amongst brethren. A lot of that was mentioned in the epistle of Paul to the, to the carnal Christians of Corinth. You've known my patience, meaning his, that word means to bear under. 
His patience caused him to remain firm under the most discouraging circumstances. And therefore, he never capitulated to self-pity nor to despair. We have no reason to wallow in despair, Christian, because this world is not our home. All of the discomforts of this life ought to make us simply all the more homesick for our eternal abode. So we have a blessed hope, and that is the hope of His glorious appearing. Because this life is not our heaven. In fact, this life is no heaven at all. Whatever part of the globe you belong to. You've known my persecutions. These are his, his harassing experiences. When opposition came and event, eventually, eventually sometimes it forced the Apostle Paul to flee. Because of persecution. His life was being threatened. Imagine the, the obstacles that Paul had to face. And you've known my afflictions. Again, which is again the product of his persecution. You see that especially in the book of Acts, perhaps in chapter 13 and 14. Paul's in divine deliverance was unshakable. That's why he wrote to the Corinthian believers. Listen, Corinthians believers, and for all of us, we need to be reminded that there hath no temptation overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And he knew that God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but he will with that temptation provide a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. See? That was Paul's confidence. God is faithful. Regardless of your trial, you may be going through the dregs, Christian, the toughest trial ever since, the best. The toughest you've ever known in your life. I was talking to a Christian lady this week. I said, Pastor, this is different. I mean, no, it's not different. Uh, this is common to man. Pastor, I've never gone through this. Perhaps, but, you know, maybe the intensity of your suffering or the intensity of your trials is simply an indication of the maturity of your faith. And that is why, remember, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able. But he will, with that temptation, he will provide you a way of escape. He didn't say so that you may be able to escape it, no, but that you may be able to bear it. Trials come and we have to live with the trials that we have to face in a fallen world. And the blessing is God has given us and will give us the sufficient grace to bear it, not necessarily to escape it. These are all intended to mold character, to make us more homesick for our eternal abode. So then Paul reminds Timothy, all that he was going through is not something unique. You know why? Because, verse 12, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, not just me, Paul says, but all who desire to live godly in Christ. This is not going to be surprising that they go through the same. All who desire to live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. You see, living godly in Christ Jesus denotes living in the right attitude to God and things divine. It means loyalty to true, authentic Christian living or religion. That's what Paul did. Okay? And every Christian who will go through, who will dedicate their lives to Christ, and live righteously in a fallen sinful world, do not be surprised if the world will hate you. That's what John says in his epistle. Okay, Do not be surprised. Jesus said the same thing in the Gospels. In the Gospel of John, John records Jesus' statement. Okay, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. We're living in a world of sinners. Many of them do not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior or regard the Bible as their authority for, or basis for belief and behavior. It is therefore not surprising if unsaved people will be hostile to the message of God's truth. Besides, the gospel exposes their sin. It exposes their guilt. And that makes them really uncomfortable. And that discomfort that the Holy Spirit brings in their life was intended to bring them into godly sorrow and repentance and to faith in Jesus Christ. You know, that's the reality of things. When we bring the gospel to any sinner, it will not make them feel better. It will make them feel bad first before they make them feel better. It will make them feel bad of their guilt, and that was intended to bring them 
to the cross, to Christ. Their sins have brought them to condemnation, but there is forgiveness, there is cleansing, there is restoration, there is salvation found exclusively in Christ. That's the beauty of the gospel. And only then can they finally find the peace that any searching soul is looking for. So here there, uh, here there is a double contrast between impostors and Timothy in verse 13. He says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So we have a double contrast between Timothy and the impostors. And then also a contrast between the Timothy's the abiding in the truth. And they're going away from the truth. They will go from bad to worse. First as deceivers, and then they themselves being deceived. They begin by seducers, by being the seducers, and they end up in being dupes themselves. And the dupes very often of their own deceptions, of their own snares. You know why? Because deceit commonly leads to self-deceit. And most people don't realize that. You see, sin makes one person, a person blind spiritually. And the more you sin, people are lulled into the pleasures of sin that always is there only for a season. But sin always blinds you and, and, and snares you into the devil's trap. And before you realize, you realize it, you're believing a lie. You have duped yourself and such a result may well act as a warning to timothy and those committed to his charge uh, of the peril of trifling with the fundamentals of the finally revealed truth anybody who tampers or trifles with the truth of the word of god is in danger of deceiving himself not only is he teaching deception, he will deceive himself as well. That's why I said, Paul says, Yea, all, all who will live God in Christ will suffer persecution, but evil men in contrast uh, eventually will wax worse and worse. Evil men and seducers will get even worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's simply what's going to happen. But this is the blessing of abiding in the truth. The truth of the gospel and the word of God gives you clearness of thought, clarity of thought, so that you live in the light of the gospel. You're not living in darkness. And you see the path the way God presents it. So that, that's why Paul says in verse 14, but while men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, you, Timothy, in contrast, you, verse 14, continue thou in the thing. So the first safeguard we already mentioned in chapter 3 verse 5 stay away from such turn away from churches or from gatherings or from religious gatherings that have given into apostasy. They will have a form of godliness but they deny the power of the such turn away Paul tells Timothy and these are God breathed or inspired instructions for Christians today. There is no point staying inside an apostate, infected, religious church or denomination. Turn away. Now, from the verse, verses of our text this morning, another safeguard that God's word gives is, of course, the godly example of people whom we respect, who are transparent, who live by the truth of the gospel. That's a safeguard. And Timothy was blessed with the with the testimony, the powerful testimony of Timothy, or of the Apostle Paul. Remember, Paul was a murderer of Christians. <laughs> he was out there to wipe out churches before he got saved. And yet he got radically transformed. And there's no other natural explanation to it. It's only a supernatural explanation. It's the miracle of the new birth, wrought by the Spirit of God. Because the miracle of the new birth, the new birth is wrought not by man, but the Spirit of God Himself. Now, what else? Aside from the godly example of Paul, Paul Genshin's verses 14 and 15 as another safeguard from the falling away from the truth, from the apostasy. And what is it? Timothy's 
childhood training. The first is Paul's godly example. Second is Timothy's childhood training. Perhaps not all of us had childhood biblical training. Many of us perhaps like me did not grow up in a Christian home. I'm a first generation Christian. I got saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But it was a person who led me to Christ. God used that witness of a faithful Christian to bring me to knowledge of, sal of salvation in Christ. My parents did not lead me to Christ. And by the grace of God, Lord willing, they did receive Christ through our witness before they went home, before they passed away. Now, while not many of us may enjoy childhood training, listen, Christian parent, Christian grandparent, your children, your grandchildren can enjoy childhood training. This was one thing that Timothy had, which I did not have. He enjoyed childhood indoctrination. That's why Paul tells Timothy, to Timothy, in spite of the latter day apostasy, you in contrast continue in the things which thou hast learned. That word continue means to remain. It means to abide. And that's a present imperative. In the active voice. And every time you, by the way, every time you have an imperative in scripture, just like in the English language, if there's a command, sit, what is the subject of that verb? It's always you. Timothy, you continue in the things which I was learned. And the word of God is telling you, as he is telling me, in the light of the latter day apostasy of which we are already living, and things will even get worse. You, I, you and I should continue in the things which we have learned. He's talking about apostolic doctrine. Well, how do we know that? Well, notice the nature of his training. This is the imparting of information as is, as is required by an, a disciple from his teacher. Continue where? In the things which thou hast learned. As a disciple. And, and remember, Jewish parents, Paul, Timothy had that privilege sitting under the sound teaching of his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. And Jewish parents, by the way, as I come across further reading, did you know that a typical godly Jewish home, in a Jewish home where there are godly parents, do you know that they teach their children in their fifth year, Okay. At age five, they teach their children the law. That is the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Did you, have you ever heard a Christian home today teaching a five-year-old the book of Leviticus or Deuteronomy? That's probably unheard of today. But that's the typical of a godly Jewish home who perhaps during even Old Testament times they had not, did not have the benefit of the New Testament, but because they knew that the Old Testament was the inspired word of God, they had to let their children know the law as early as five years old. What a challenge that is for Christians today. We should be doing the same. We should be grounding, indoctrinating our children to the truth of the Word of God. And this can never be overemphasized. Instead of, uh, you know, psychologists or psychiatrists, or they call it, let them discover their own selves. That's what they say. Let them find themselves in the, in, in the world. No, we are told to instruct our children the truth of the Word of God, as it was in the case of Timothy. No wonder Timothy had a solid foundation. He knew where to base his belief as well as behavior in the truth of the word of God. So Paul says, continue in the things which you have learned. That was the nature of Paul's, or rather Timothy's training. The curriculum for his training was what? You've known, verse 14, continue the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And then verse 15, Paul tells Timothy and reminds him, and that from a child, Timothy, thou hast known what? What is the curriculum for his training? It's the scriptures, the holy scriptures. Now, I was watching the news just the other day, yesterday, 
And that's a big problem with the Department of Education, not only in this country, but I guess it's true in other parts of the world, especially that schools are now shut down and that now they're thinking for other alternative ways of learning, uh, online teaching, online courses, etc. And in this country, there's a problem because not everybody has access to online. You know what? Let me remind you, do you know that this book is a curriculum in itself? And it's complete. It's a complete curriculum, a complete education. Did you know that? You have poetry, you have history, you have archaeology, you have law, you have epistle, you have apocalypse, apocalyptic literature. It's a complete record and a complete curriculum in itself. And that's why if you want to be a good teacher to your children, your grandchildren, teach them the Word of God. It is sufficient for godly life and service. That's the curriculum that we ought to be using. The, the scriptures itself. Now, of course, for Timothy, the, not one line of the New Testament was yet written when he was young. But even Timothy, as early as five, was exposed to the Old Testament. Now, we have the privilege and the blessing of God's complete revelation from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation to teach the next generation the Word of God, the curriculum for training. And notice the purpose for his training. Paul says, from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures. And what is the purpose of the Scriptures? It's the Scriptures is able to make you wise unto salvation. You see, this book is a book of salvation. Paul already mentioned, things will get worse. Sin will grow rampant. Evil men shall wax worse and worse and get deceiving and being deceived. But you know what, Timothy? What will deliver you from all of this mess is this book that will deliver. It's the book of salvation. And that's the scriptures. In verse 15, apparently Paul was talking about the Old Testament scriptures. Timothy, from a child you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. This is a book of salvation. A book of deliverance. And where is this deliverance found? It says in verse 15, it's a, it'll make you wise unto salvation, which is where? In Christ Jesus. Salvation is found in no other. For there is no other name given under heaven, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 But how can it be yours? How can it be mine? In that same verse, it says, it can be yours through faith. Not through good works, not through rituals, relics, rules, or beads of religion. It's through faith in Christ. When you receive Him by faith, you become a child of God. John 1 verse 12. So this is a book on salvation. The Bible leads one to salvation. And the word salvation is an all-inclusive term meaning deliverance. Not necessarily from the problems brought about by the sin carriers of the world, but salvation, deliverance from sin's penalty from sin's power, and from sin's presence. When a person trusts in Christ as Savior, John 5, 24, Jesus said, Very, very, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me, he has or possesses everlasting life. He has passed from death unto life. So that's sin's penalty. And then Romans 6, 12 to 14 talks about the process of sanctification. The believer in Christ can grow and overcome the power of sin in his day-to-day -day life through the process of sanctification. Romans chapter 8 talks about being delivered, the promise of being delivered from the presence of sin on the day of glorification. That's the salvation that God gives. It's complete. And it is found in Christ. It's exclusively found in Christ. And the means by which we have it is through faith in Him. The means by which we are delivered. When this is added to the, soul, to the soul of the inquirer that the sacred writings have their illuminating power without faith, it will keep those of us who study away from the truth. It is not enough to know the Word of God. We need to believe the Word of God. Appropriated by faith so that the blessings of it become ours. Salvation and deliverance become ours. People do not believe because of the lack of evidence, but despite the evidence. 
That is why we always say, see, the problem with man is not a problem of scholarship. It's a problem of lordship. There is enough evidence of who God is and who Christ is and the gospel. God has made it plain and clear through creation, through conscience, through divine revelation and scripture. And yet people will still not believe because this is not a problem of scholarship. It's a problem of lordship. It's not a problem of the intellect. It's a problem of the will. That's why Jesus said in John 5, 40, you will not come to me that you might have life. It's not that they cannot, they will not come to him in spite of the glaring evidence. You know, there's a saying which says, a man against his will is of the same opinion still. So what we do is only plant the seed of the gospel. If they reject, it's not our accountability, it's theirs. It is our response to plant the seed and explain the truth answer those questions, and that's as far as we can go. We can plant, we can water, God's word says, it is God who gives the increase. Remember, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Therefore, it has to be mixed with faith. There's one more thing mentioned in verses 16, 17, that will help us to withstand the apostasy. Aside from separation, from such, turn away. Turn away from apostasy. Aside from Godly examples of men and women whom we respect in the Christian faith. Aside from, as we saw in the second point, aside from childhood training. So parents, we need to ground our children. Remember, can you imagine the world in which they will live in when we're no longer around? Given 10, 15 years from now, should the Lord tarry his coming, 20 years from now, what kind of a world they're going to live in? So right now we need to equip them with the word of God so that they will know how to be saved and how to live according to the principles of God's unchanging word. But verses 16 and 17, the third and strongest uh, deterrent or tool to withstand the apostasy is what? The sacred writings. This book is a book of deliverance that is found in Christ. It can be ours through faith. And did you notice in verse 16, if verse 15 is talking about the Old Testament scriptures, because not one line of the, Old, of the New Testament was written when Timothy was young. But did you notice in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Did you notice the shift there? Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures, Old Testament. But all scripture, verse 16, is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable or useful. Notice the all scripture from the Holy Scripture. In other words, all scripture in verse 16 is talking about all scripture. It includes the Holy Scripture of the Old Testament, but it also includes the New Testament. Why? Because 1 Timothy 5, 17, Paul called the Gospel of Luke Scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter called the writings of Paul Scripture. So when Paul said in his last inspired all scripture, it includes the New Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is breathed out by God. The Greek word inspiration is theopneustos, which means God breathed. No portion of the scripture is worthless. All the New Testament is the word of God. In fact, in other words, what Paul is saying here is the Bible is not only the word of God, it is the very breath of God. That's why Jesus says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's the, that's the quality of this book. And it's going to be a safeguard against the apostasy. We need to be soaking ourselves, saturating ourselves with the truths of this book so that we see reality from his perspective, life from his lens, instead of from the, light, from the lens of popular opinion. Or what is politically correct. That's why it's verbally and plenarily inspired. And it is profitable or useful for doctrine. That's another word for teaching. Doctrine is what we ought to believe. So, and it is, it is to instruct the ignorant. That's what the Bible is there for. It's for reproof. It is what we ought to forsake. Okay? It rebukes us of errors in our life. It is a mirror that points out areas in our life that needs to be straightened out to where we should be rebuked. So what we ought to forsake. Therefore, the Bible was given to convince the guilty. It is useful for correction. 
In other words, how we ought to rectify our errors in order to reclaim the fallen. See, there is room for restoration for those who have been ensnared by sin. We all came from a sinful background, from a depraved background, but thank God there is cleansing and restoration in Christ. And it says it is profitable or useful for instruction in righteousness. In other words, it tells us what we ought to do and where we ought to go. It is a school in all holiness. That's why it's a complete education in itself. And verse 17 says that the man of God may be perfect. That word perfect means not sinlessly perfect. It means complete. So that the man of God, Timothy in this case, might be matured or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, Timothy, you know what you need in the light of perilous days coming? Do you know what you need in the light of apostasy rushing with the tide? Do you know what you need for godly life and service? It's all, all scripture. It is sufficient for godly life. It is all that we need to mature and to equip one for godly life and service. That's why it's a complete curriculum. You're having a problem how to teach your children, especially in the light of this, the dilemma of these lockdowns and pandemic. Listen, this book is a curriculum in itself. And it's complete. And it will take a lifetime to exhaust this book. As a matter of fact, more than a lifetime. It is a book that talks about things in this life as well as in the life to come. What a great book this is. What a priceless treasure we have in our hands. So, there is going to be apostasy. And the strong tides of unbelief are going to flood. They will come in like a flood, like a tsunami. But... What will guard yourself against this, how to help to withstand this apostasy is godly examples of people we respect, of our childhood training, and that's why we need to instruct our children the Word of God and the sacred writings. Aside from what has been mentioned in chapter 3, 5, if there is apostasy in your congregation, in your church, from such turn away. Now, it is my prayer for myself, for my family, for all of us in our church, and for those of us, the rest of us who are watching this video. Listen, the apostasy is here, and it will continue to increase. It will escalate in an increasing crescendo until the great apostate of all, Satan incarnate, the man of sin, will finally be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. So that will be the culmination of the apostasy. And we're seeing these signs everywhere already. Thankfully, before he comes into the scenario and be known, the rapture would have taken place. So how do you guard ourselves against the growing apostasy? We have this book. Study it. Read it. Memorize it. Saturate yourself with its truths. Believe it. Live it. And even if necessary, die for it. You know why? Because it is in tr indeed in truth the Word of God. Are you going to heed it? That's the only way to withstand the coming apostasy. And I pray and trust that you and I will heed this God-breathed charge. Our Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you, Lord, for <clears throat> the privilege of expounding these truths, even in these unusual circumstances. Unprecedented times, we thank you that in these days of apostasy, that the truth can be proclaimed freely still in our field. And we pray none of us will take these for granted, and all the more we will gra grab every opportunity given us to propagate this truth to our friends, to our loved ones, to our constituents, to our peers, to everyone. We owe thee, Lord, uh, everything, and we we do you a great dishonor if we do not tell all. We do humanity a service if we do not tell all of the gospel of Christ. And help us to make a conscious effort to be an instrument of blessing to others, both through our life that should be backing up our lips with the message of the gospel. And we shall thank you for it. For this we ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you for joining us and stay well, stay healthy. And should the Lord tarry, we'll see you again in the next video. God bless you.